Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Two Dimensional Velocity and Acceleration Problems. This is part one. So in the last two lessons, we've learned how to handle velocity as a vector in a two dimensional plane, uh, or also in three dimensional space, really, because it's extensible to three dimensions, and also acceleration in two or in three dimensions. And now we're going to sharpen our pencils and solve some problems. And one thing you're going to find is that we've now done the theory of what's going on. Solving the problems, it, it, it's a little easier really because you can just deal with the numbers and just kind of focus on what we need to do and you don't have to carry through all of the theoretical baggage that we have to get through in the beginning. It's very helpful to know that stuff so that you know what we're doing. I, that's why I taught it. But I guess what I'm trying to say is we don't have to like draw a million pictures for every, every single one of these problems. We usually do have to draw one or two pictures. Okay, so problem number one says, a meteor is spotted at two different locations in the sky. Point A is 5.000 kilometers, comma, 1.200 kilometers. Point B is 6.240 kilometers, comma, 0 0.9250 kilometers. Uh, so those are the xy coordinates of point A and point B. Over an elapsed time period of delta t is equal to 1.140 seconds. Part A says, we're going to find the x and y components of the average velocity between points A and B. And then in the next part, part B, we're going to find the magnitude and the direction of this average velocity vector. So you see now we have two dimensions because I can't just tell you that the point is, you know, five meters to the right of the starting point. I can't just tell, give you one number. I have to give you a pair of numbers to specify in the xy plane where the meteor is. And at point A, it's at 5.000 kilometers, comma, 1.200 kilometers, and at point P, uh, B, sometime later, the meteor has moved. So we start from a position, we end up in a position, and we want to figure out what is the average velocity between position one and position two. So the first thing we need to do is draw a picture. So if we have an XY coordinate system, something like this, and you don't have to be, you know, a master artist, because I know I'm not a master artist, but what you do need to do uh, when you solve physics problems is you need to get in the habit of drawing a picture, even if it's a simple little sketch for a simple little problem. So in this case, we have one of those situations. All right, so initially the meteor is spotted five comma, let's call it 1.2, something like this. We'll call this point A. And the coordinates of point A are 5.000 kilometers comma 1.200 kilometers. So we have to have two numbers uh, in, as, as, as an xy coordinate you know, pair in order to specify the location of the initial position of the meteor. But then later, the meteor moves down a little bit like this, and how do we know it moves down this direction? Because the coordinates, I'll, call it, I'll go down here, I'll say at point B, are 6.240 kilometers, comma, 0 0.9250 kilometers. So we can see that doesn't label this point B right here. Basically what's happened is now the meteor may have gone all over the place and ended up here, but we're going to assume that it's gone some sort of straight line distance. Of course it could have been in some kind of curved trajectory. So we know that it more or less looks like this because the x coordinate increases to 6.240, so it goes this way. But we started up, uh, you know, 1.2 kilometers in the sky and then we ended up lower 0.925. So the x coordinate increased, but the y coordinate decreased. So we're assuming that we had some kind of slanting down kind of trajectory like this. All right, so how do we figure out for part A, what it's asking us to do is the average velocity. Now, when we, we did the theory, theory lessons, I treated this as a vector. You know, this is a position vector. The position vector, I haven't drawn it on the board, but the position vector would go from the origin to point A and that would be position vector number one, and the position vector uh, for the second point would be from the origin here. And the way you would find the velocity is you would subtract the position vectors, divide by the time. Now that's all fine, but we know the coordinates of the points, x comma y for point A and x comma y for point B. So almost always in physics, it's going to be way easier just to deal in components. Instead of wrapping up the whole vector entity and dealing with all the vector arithmetic all at once, we're going to break it into the x motion and the y motion and calculate everything separately. That way, when we, you know, take into account gravity later, gravity is only acting vertical. So we can apply gravity to the vertical motion separate from the horizontal motion. So what we can say is that the average velocity uh, in the x direction 
is going to be equal to the change in position in the x direction, xb minus xa. And then we're going to divide this by the time elapsed, delta t. So these equations come straight out of the lesson on average velocity. We just take the final position minus the initial position in t, and we're only subtracting the x positions, which are, all, which are given to us in our problem statement here. So for instance, we know that the average velocity in the x direction, the final position of x is 6.240 kilometers, 6.240, and the initial position in the x coordinate is 5.0, 5.000 kilometers. Now you can write the units down if you want, but I know I'm subtracting kilometers. On the bottom, it tells us delta t, we're dividing by the time elapsed, which is 1.140 seconds. So you have kilometers on the top and seconds on the bottom. So when you subtract these numbers, you're going to get 1.240, that's kilometers on the top, and on the bottom, you still have the 1.140, and that's seconds, all right? And so what do you get? You get, when you take this, you divide it by this, you get 1.09 kilometers per second. Now, what does this mean? Is this the absolute magnitude of the speed of the meteor? No, this is only the speed of the meteor in the x direction. The actual meteor is starting up high in the sky, and it's traveling down toward the ground, but also continuing to move horizontal, you know, parallel to the ground as well, but it's also coming down. When we calculate the average velocity in the x direction being 1.09 kilometers per second, it's not the total velocity, it's only how far in the x direction, horizontal, parallel to the ground, how much of the speed is, is in that direction. Now, separately, we need to calculate how fast is the thing traveling down vertically. And the vector sum of those two, two motions, they put together the actual motion of the, of the meteor in a slanted way across the skies. We have the horizontal motion and we have the vertical motion coming down. So for that vertical motion coming down, we need to find the average velocity in the y direction. So we do the same sort of thing. It's going to be the y uh, final position, in position b. That's the, you know, the, the, play, the, the, final, um, the final observation, point b, minus the a position in the y coordinate divided by delta t. So you see we're treating the components separate, calculating the x and y velocity separate. So the final position b of in the y coordinate, 0 0.9250, 0 0.9250, this is kilometers. The initial position in the y coordinate, 1.200, 1.200, these are both kilometers. And on the bottom, it's 1.140 seconds again. Because the observation, uh, it, it's, this is the same time as we are observing the, the x motion and the y motion. They're both occurring over 1.140 seconds. Now notice this number is smaller than this one. So when you take 0 0.9250 and you subtract this larger number, you're actually gonna get a negative number, 0 0.275, this is kilometers, and on the bottom, 1.140 seconds. All right, so what have you figured out? That the uh, average velocity in the y direction when you take this number divided by this one, you're going to get a negative answer. You'll get negative 0 0.241, and that's kilometers per second. Kilometers on the uh, top and seconds on the bottom. So this is the average velocity in the y direction. Notice it's negative, and we already wrote down the other one, so I'll just write it down again. The average velocity in the x direction is a positive 1.09 kilometers per second. So what does this tell us? Well, the x average velocity between the endpoints is a positive number in kilometers per second. So that means going from point A to point B, it's traveling in the x direction in the positive way, 1.09 kilometers per second, that way towards the positive x direction. But for the y component of the, of the motion, it's a negative number. Now, if, if we define the coordinate system to be positive y up, then a negative velocity is pointing down. And this tells us what we expect, that the velocity of the meteor in the y direction is negative, which means it must be going toward the ground vertically at what speed? Uh, negative 0 0.241 kilometers per second. So you can see that it's traveling faster horizontal to the ground compared to its vertical motion, but the vertical motion is dropping toward the ground. So the two components together paint the picture of the falling meteor in a slanted direction towards the ground. So that handles part A. Uh, part A was to find the x and y components of the average velocity between the points A and B. 
point B, uh, part B is to find the magnitude and direction of the average velocity vector between those points. So in general, there's really two ways to represent a vector. The first way is just to represent the x and y coordinates of the vector. That's what we've done. This is a velocity vector. This is the x component of it, and this is the y component of it. You can see right here from my drawing that uh, the meteor is slanted, but we can break it up. The, the path is slanted. The velocity is slanted, but we can break it up into an x coordinate, which is going down, which we just calculated, and a y component going across, which we've also just calculated. So we just calculated this vector going down and this vector going to the side, or these components uh, of this vector which add to this. All right? But there's another way to represent the direction of a vector. Another way. You still need two numbers. Instead of x comma y, we can specify the two numbers, one of them being the magnitude or the length of the arrow, and the other uh, number being the angle that the arrow is. So if I want to specify any, any point in this, or any vector in this coordinate system, I can specify the x, y the coordinates of the tip, or I can specify how long the arrow is and what angle the arrow is you know, measured from the positive x-axis like this. So even if I have a vector over here, I can specify the x-y coordinate points of the tip. That's one way of specifying it. But I can also specify it as the length of the vector and its angle from the x-axis. So in order to do that, we're going to write down the components again. I'm just going to write them again. We just found them. V average in the x direction. We just said it was 1.09 kilometers per second. And v average in the y direction, we said it was negative 0.241 kilometers per second. So this forms a triangle. Notice it is a right triangle, right? So if we know that this, we know this side of the right triangle because we just calculated it. We know this side of the right triangle because if we just calculated it. So to find the magnitude, which is the length of this arrow, we just use the Pythagorean theorem. We just use the Pythagorean theorem. And so since we know that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, and if we label this, uh, this is the y component, this is the x component of the velocity, if this we just label the vector, uh, the, the actual vector, uh, not x and y component, the actual total uh, motion there, the total velocity vector, then we can find the length of this vector. These bars around the vector mean we're trying to find the length of it. What is it in meters per second, the length in, in both directions at the same time? And what we do is we take the square root of the average velocity in the x direction, we square it, and then we do the average velocity in the y direction, and we square it. And once we square them and add them together, we take the square root. Why? Because this side squared plus this side squared must equal the length of this side also squared. So this squared plus this squared equals this squared, and if we do the square root of both sides to, to solve for this, then we have to take the square root of this. So the magnitude of the vector is under the square root symbol, we have the x component here, 1.09 squared. The y component here, negative 0.241 squared. All right? And when we square this, we're going to get a positive number. When we square this, it's negative. But when we square it, we also make it positive. When we square those numbers and add them all together, what do we actually get? We get the square root of 1.246. Now this was, you know, in terms of kilometers, so then once we take that square root over there, then the magnitude works out to be 1.120, and it's kilometers per second. So we figured out the magnitude of the velocity vector v. So what does this mean? It means that the length of this arrow, which is a mixture of both x and y motions, uh, the velocity vector is 1.120 kilometers per second. The bigger the number you get, the longer the vector arrow is. So that's half of half of what the vector is, its magnitude. So we know the total speed along the actual path is 1.120 second, which is a mixture of the x direction speed, 1.09, notice it's a little smaller, and the y component going down, 0.241. These two kind of sum together gives us the slanted motion, which is 1.120 kilometers per second. Okay, or one point, I guess I should say 1.12 kilometers per second. All right, now how do we figure out the angle? So the angle, notice from trigonometry, there's some angle here uh, uh, that we can uh, measure to, to specify the direction of this velocity vector. And this vector uh, angle here is going to be the inverse tangent. 
And this is where the trigonometry comes in of the y component of the velocity divided by the x component of the velocity. Now, if you're not sure how this works or why it's the inverse tangent or whatever, just basically let's redraw what we have here. So the actual motion here is something like this. This is like point A and this is point B. All right. And what we basically said is we can break this motion up into components. And we have a X component here and we have a Y component here of, of the motion. Right. This goes this way and this goes this way. And what we basically are saying is that there's some and this is kind of like if you want to in super superimpose, this is the X axis. And then over here, this is the y axis, right? And there's some angle here, theta. How do you figure out what this angle is? The thing is going down below the horizon like this. And so from trigonometry, the tangent of any angle is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. That's why it's the y side of the triangle divided by the x side, or the y velocity component divided by the x velocity component. So we're just taking the y average velocity divided by the x average velocity, which are the different sides of this triangle. And then we take the inverse tangent of that to figure out what the angle is. So the tangent of uh, the y is negative 0 0.241 and the x is 1.09. Where did I get these from? Because the y average velocity is what we had here, negative 0 0.241 and the x is 1.09. We just stick them right in there. When we divide these, we have to find the inverse tangent of 0 0.22, sorry, negative 0 0.221. And then when you dump this into a calculator and figure out the inverse tangent, you're going to get negative 12.4 degrees. Now, what is negative 12.4 degrees? Remember from trigonometry, when we have like an x an xy coordinate system, the angles are measured up from the positive axis. So here's 90 degrees, and here's 180 degrees, and here's 270 degrees, and here's 360 degrees. But if you get a negative angle, it just means you go the other way, 12 degrees below the horizontal. So this is below the x-axis. We could convert this to a positive angle if we want. It's going to be close to 360 degrees, but really it's just easier to say negative 12.4 degrees, and that just means it's slanted down. And from our original uh, diagram, all this means is the meteor is traveling at a speed of 1.12 kilometers per second along its path at an angle 12.4 degrees down below the local horizontal right here, 12, 12 degrees down. So you see how you can specify a vector in two ways. These are two completely different but equivalent ways of specifying the basically what the vector is doing because a vector is magnitude and direction. The first way that we can specify the the what a vector is doing is by just specifying the components. Here's the x velocity, here's the y velocity. The x and y velocity, uh, 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 the x and y components there specify uniquely the vector and where it's pointed and its, 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 its strength, its magnitude, all that stuff. But instead of doing it that way, you can also specify the vector as the length of the vector arrow, which is its, in this case, its speed, and then the angle that that thing is going. Notice that we have a two-dimensional plane, x and y, so you always need two numbers to, spe to specify which direction and how big this vector is. One way, you need an x, y coordinate point, that's two numbers. Another way, you need the magnitude of the vector and its angle from the x axis, that's still two numbers. You can't get away from needing two numbers, they're just two equivalent ways of specifying which way this vector is pointing and the strength of this vector, in this case, the speed. So a fairly simple problem, but a very important problem because we're going to be breaking vectors into components um, and, and figuring out you know, average velocity and acceleration you know, throughout the class. We need to know how to do this in order to solve any more complicated motion, like a projectile motion under the force of gravity, for instance. So solve this. When you feel like you understand how we calculated the answers, follow me on the part two. We'll continue to build your skills.